Chapter 19, page 302. Can you believe I read 302 pages? Live free or die, an ancient saying, provenance unknown, listed in the comprehensive compilation of dangerous words and ideas, www.ccdwi.gov.org. One of the strangest things about life is that it will chug on, blind and oblivious, even as your private world, your little carved out sphere, is twisting and morphing, morphing, even breaking apart. One day you have parents, the next day you're an orphan. One day you have a place and a path. The next day you are lost in a wilderness. And still the sun rises and clouds mass and drift and people shop for groceries and toilets flush and blinds go up and down. That's when you realize that most of it, life, the relentless mechanism of existing, isn't about you. It doesn't include you at all. It will thrust onward even after you've jumped the edge, even after you're dead. When I make my way back into downtown Portland in the morning, that's what surprises me the most, how normal everything looks. I don't know what I was expecting. I didn't really think that the buildings would be tumbled down overnight, that the streets would have melted into rubble, but it's still a shock to see a stream of people carrying briefcases and shop owners unlocking their front doors and a single car trying to push through a crowded street. It seems absurd that they don't know, haven't felt any change or tremor, even as my life has been completely turned upside down. As I head home, I keep feeling paranoid, like someone will be able to smell the wilds on me, will be able to tell just from seeing my face that I've crossed over. The back of my neck itches as though it's being poked with branches, and I keep whipping off my backpack to make sure there aren't any leaves or burrs clinging to it. Not that it matters, since it's not like Portland is treeless. But no one even glances in my direction. It's a little before 9 o'clock, and most people are rushing to get to work on time. An endless blur of normal people doing normal things, eyes straight ahead of them, paying no attention to the, sort, to the short, nondescript girl with a lumpy backpack pushing past them. The short, nondescript girl with a secret burning inside her like a fire. It's as though my night in the wilds has sharpened my vision around the edges. Even though everything looks superficially the same, it seems somehow different. Flimsy, almost, as though you could put your hand through the buildings and sky and even the people. I remember being very young and watching Rachel build a sandcastle at the beach. She must have worked on it for hours. Natasha Springer, come to the office immediately, please. Natasha Springer, to the office. Using different cups and containers to shape towers and turrets. When it was done, it looked perfect, like it could have been made out of stone. But when the tide came in, it didn't take more than two or three waves to dissolve its shape entirely. I remember I burst into tears, and my mother bought me an ice cream cone and made me share it with Rachel. That's what Portland looks like this morning, like something in danger of dissolving. I keep thinking about what Alex always says, there are more of us than you think. I sneak a glance at everyone who goes by, thinking maybe I'll be able to read some secret sign on their faces, some mark of resistance, but everyone looks the same as always, harried, hurried, annoyed, zoned out. When I get home, Carol's in the kitchen washing dishes. I try to scoot past her, but she calls out to me. I pause with one foot on the stairs. She comes into the hallway, wiping her hands on a dish towel. How was Hannah's, she asks. She flicks her eyes all over my face, searchingly, as though checking for signs of something. I try to will back another bout of paranoia. She couldn't possibly know where I've been. It was fine, I say, shrugging, trying to sound casual. Didn't get a lot of sleep, though. Hmm. Carol keeps looking at me intensely. What did you girls do together? She never asks about Hannah's house, hasn't for years. Something's wrong, I think. You know, the usual, watch some TV. Hannah gets like seven channels. I can't tell if my voice sounds weird and high-pitched or if I'm just imagining it. Carol looks away, twisting her mouth like she's totally gotten a mouthful of sour milk. I can tell she's trying to work out a way to say something unpleasant. She gets her sour milk face whenever she has to give out bad news. She knows about Alex. She knows. She knows. The walls press closer and the heat is stifling. Then, to my surprise, she curls her mouth into a smile, reaches out, and places a hand on my arm. You know, Lena, it won't be like this for very much longer. I've successfully avoided thinking about the procedure for 24 hours, but now that awful looming number pops back into my head, throwing a shadow over everything. 17 days. I know, I squeeze out. Now my voice definitely sounds weird. Carol nods and keeps the strange half-smile plastered to her face. I know it's hard to believe, but you won't miss her once it's over. I know. Like there's a dying frog caught in my throat. Carol keeps nodding at me really vigorously. It looks as though her head is connected to a yo-yo. I get the feeling she wants to say something more, something that will reassure me, but she obviously can't think of anything because we just stand there, frozen like that for almost a minute. Finally, I say, I'm going upstairs. Shower? It takes all my willpower just to get out the words. Seventeen days keeps tearing through my mind like an alarm. Carol seems relieved that I've broken the silence. Okay, she says. Okay. 
I start up the stairs two at a time. I can't wait to lock myself in the bathroom. Even though it must be more than 80 degrees in the house, I want to stand under a stream of beating hot water and melt myself into vapor. Oh, Lena, Carol calls out to me almost as an afterthought. I turn around and she's not looking at me. She's inspecting the fraying border of one of, one of her dish towels. You should put on something nice, a dress or those pretty white slacks you got last year, and do your hair. Don't just leave it to air dry. Why? I don't like the way she won't look at me, especially since her mouth is going all screwy again. I invited Brian Scharf to come over today, she says casually, as though it's an everyday normal thing. Brian Scharf, I repeat dumbly. The name feels strange in my mouth and brings with it the taste of metal. Carol snaps her head up and looks at me. Not alone, she says quickly. Of course not alone. His mother will be coming with him. And I'll be here too, obviously. Besides, Brian had his procedure last month. As though that's what's bothering me. He's coming here? Today? I have to reach out and place one hand on the wall. Somehow I've managed to completely forget about Brian Scharf, that neat printed name on a page. Carol must think I'm nervous about meeting him because she smiles at me. Don't worry, Lena, you'll be fine. We'll do most of the talking. I just thought you two should meet, since... She doesn't finish her sentence. She doesn't have to. Since we're paired. Since we'll be married. Since I'll share my bed with him and wake up every day of my life next to him and have to let him put his hands on me and have to sit across from him at dinner eating canned asparagus and listening to him rattle on about plumbing or carpentry or whatever it is he's going to get assigned to do. No, I burst out. Carol looks startled. She's not used to hearing that word, certainly not from me. What do you mean, no? I lick my lips. I know refusing her is dangerous, and I know it's wrong, but I can't meet Brian Scharf. I won't. I won't sit here and pretend to like him or listen to Carol talk about where we'll be in a few years. Alex is out there somewhere waiting for me to meet up with him or tapping his fingers against his desk while he listens to music or breathing or doing anything at all. I mean, I struggle for an excuse. I mean, I mean, couldn't we do it some other time? I, I don't feel really good. This, at least, is true. Carol frowns at me. It's an hour, Lena. If you can manage to sleep over at Hannah's house, you can manage that. But, but, I ball one fist up, squeezing my fingernails into my palm until pain starts blooming there, which gives me something to focus on. But I want it to be a surprise. Carol's voice takes on an edge. There's nothing surprising about this, Lena. This is the order of things. This is your life. He is your pair. You will meet him, and you will like him, and that's that. Now go upstairs and get in the shower. They'll be coming at one o'clock. One. Alex gets off at noon today. I was supposed to meet him. We were going to have a picnic at 37 Brooks like we always do whenever he comes off the morning shift and enjoy the whole afternoon together. But I start to protest, not even sure what else I can say. No buts. Carol crosses her arms and glares at me fiercely. Upstairs. I don't know how I make it up the stairs. I'm so angry I can barely see. Jenny's standing on the landing, chewing gum, dressed in one of Rachel's old bathing suits. It's too big for her. What's wrong with you, she says as I push past her. I don't answer. I make a beeline for the bathroom and turn the water as high as it can go. Carol hates it when we waste water, and normally I make my showers as quick as I can, but today I don't care. I sit on the toilet and stuff my fingers in my mouth, biting down to keep from screaming. This is all my fault. I've been ignoring the date of the procedure, and I've avoided even thinking Brian Sharp's name. And Carol is absolutely right. This is my life in the order of things. There's no changing it. I take a deep breath and tell myself to stop being such a baby. Everyone has to grow up sometime, and my time is on September 3rd. I go to stand up, but an image of Alex last night, standing so close to me, speaking those weird, wonderful words, I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, knocks me down again, and I thud back down onto the toilet. Alex laughing, breathing, living, separately, unknown to me. Waves of nausea overtake me, and I double over with my head between my knees, fighting it. The disease, I tell myself. The disease is progressing. It will all be better after the procedure. That's the point. But it's no use. When I finally manage to get into the shower, I try to lose myself in the rhythm of the water pounding on the porcelain. But images of Alex flicker through my mind, kissing me, stroking my hair, dancing his fingers over my skin, dancing, flashing like light from a candle about to be snuffed out. The worst is that I can't even let Alex know I won't be able to meet him. It's too dangerous to call him. My plan was to go to the labs and tell him in person, but when I come downstairs, showered and dressed, and head for the door, Carol stops me. Where do you think you're going, she says sharply. I can tell she's still angry that I was arguing with her earlier. Angry and probably offended. She no doubt thinks I should be turning cartwheels because I've finally been paired. She has a right to think it. A few months ago, I would have been turning cartwheels. I turn my eyes to the ground, attempting to sound as sweet and meek as possible. I just thought I'd take a walk before Brian comes. I try to conjure up a blush. I'm kind of nervous.
You've been spending enough time out of the house as it is, Carol snaps back, and you'll only get sweaty and dirty again. If you want something to do, you can help me organize the linen closet. There's no way I can disobey my aunt, so I follow her back upstairs and sit on the floor as she passes ratty towel after ratty towel down to me, and I inspect them for holes and stains and damage, fold and refold, count napkins. I'm so angry and frustrated I'm shaking. Alex won't know what's happened to me. He'll worry, or even worse, he'll think I'm deliberately avoiding him. Maybe he'll think going to the wilds freaked me out. It frightens me how violent I'm feeling. Crazy, almost, incapable of anything. I want to climb up the walls, burn down the house, something. Several times I have the fantasy of taking one of Carol's stupid dish towels and strangling her with it. This is what all the textbooks and the book of shh and parents and teachers have always warned me about. I don't know whether they're right or whether Alex is. I don't know whether these feelings, this thing growing inside of me, is something horrible and sick or if it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Either way, I can't stop it. I've lost control. And the truly sick thing is that despite everything, I'm glad. At 12.30, Carol moves me downstairs to the living room, which I can tell has been straightened and cleaned. My uncle's shipping orders, which are usually scattered everywhere, have been stacked in a neat pile, and none of the old school books and broken toys that usually litter the floor are visible. She plops me down on a sofa and begins messing with my hair. I feel like a prized pig, but I know better than to say anything about it. If I do everything she tells me, if everything goes smoothly, maybe I'll still have time to go to 37 Brooks once Brian leaves. There, Carol says, stepping away and squinting at me critically. That's as good as it's going to get. I bite my lip and turn away. I don't want her to notice, but her words have sent a sharp pain through me. Amazingly, I'd for actually forgotten that I'm supposed to be plain. I'm so used to Alex telling me I'm beautiful. I'm so used to feeling beautiful around him. A hollow opens up in my chest. This is what life will be like without him. Everything will become ordinary again. I'll become ordinary again. At a few minutes after one, I hear the front gate squeak open and the footsteps on the path. I've been so focused on Alex, I haven't had time to get nervous about Brian Scharf's arrival. But now I have the wild urge to make a run for the back door or hurdle through the open window. Thinking about what Carol would do if I, belly flop if I went belly flopping through the screen brings an uncontrollable fit of giggling. Lena, she hisses at me, just as Brian and his mother start knocking on the front door. Control yourself. Why? I'm tempted to fire back. It's not like he can do anything about it, even if he hates me. He's stuck with me, and I'm stuck with him. We're stuck. That's what growing up is all about, I guess. In my imagination, Brian Scharf was tall and fat, a hulking figure. In reality, he's only a few inches taller than I am, which is impressively short for a guy, and so thin I'm worried about breaking his wrist bone when we shake. His palms are damp with sweat, and he barely squeezes my hand. It feels like holding on to a damp tissue. Afterward, when we all take our seats, I surreptitiously wipe my hands against my pants. Thank you for coming, Carol says, and there's a long, awkward pause. In the silence, I can hear Brian wheezing through his nose. It sounds like there's a dying animal trapped in his nasal canal. I must be staring because Mrs. Scharf explains, Brian has asthma. Oh, I say. The allergies make it worse. Um, what is he allergic to? I ask because she seems to be expecting it. Dust, she says emphatically like he's been waiting to break out that word since she sailed right through the door. She looks witheringly around the room, which is not dusty, and Carol blushes. And pollen, cats and dogs, of course, and peanuts, seafood, wheat, dairy, and garlic. I didn't know you could be allergic to garlic, I say. I can't help it. It just pops out. His face puffs up like an accordion. Mrs. Sharp turns a disdainful eye towards me as though I'm somehow responsible for this fact. Oh, I say again, and then another uncomfortable silence descends on us. Brian doesn't say anything, but he wheezes louder than ever. This time, Carol comes to the rescue. Lena, she says, perhaps Brian and Mrs. Scharf would like some water? I've never been so grateful for an excuse to leave a room in my life. I jump out of my seat, nearly taking down a lamp with my knee by accident. Of course, I'll get it. Make sure it's filtered, Mrs. Scharf calls after me as I tear out of the room, and not too much ice. In the kitchen, I take my time filling up the glasses, from the tap, obviously, and letting the cold air from the freezer blast my face. From the living room, I can hear the low murmur of conversation, but I can't make out who is speaking or what is being said. Maybe Mrs. Scharf decided to reprise her list of Brian's allergies. I know I have to go back into the living room eventually, but my feet just won't move toward the hallway. When I finally force them into action, they feel like they've been transformed into lead. They, still, they carry me far too quickly toward the living room. I keep seeing an endless series of bland days, days the color of pale yellow and white pills, days that leave the same bitter aftertaste as medicine, mornings and evenings filled with a quietly whirring humidifier and Brian's steady wheezing breath with the drip, drip, drip from a leaking faucet. There's no stopping it. The hallway doesn't last forever, and I step into the living room just in time to hear Brian say, she's not as pretty as in the pictures. 
Brian and his mom have their backs to me, but Carol's mouth falls open when she sees me standing there, and both of the sharps whiff, whiff around to see me. At least they have the grace to look embarrassed. He drops his eyes quickly, and she flushes. I've never felt so ashamed or exposed. This is worse even than standing in the translucent hospital gown at the evaluations, under the glare of the fluorescent lights. My hands are trembling so badly the water jumps over the lip of the glasses. Here's your water. I don't know where I find the strength to come around the sofa and place the glasses on the coffee table. Not too much ice. Lena, my aunt starts to say something, but I interrupt her. I'm sorry. Miraculously, I even manage a smile. I can only hold it for a fraction of a second, though. My jaw is trembling, too, and I know that any moment I might cry. I'm not feeling very well. I think I might step outside for a bit. I don't wait to be given permission. I turn around and rush the front door. As I push out into the sun, I hear Carol apologizing for me. The procedure is still several weeks away, she's saying, so you'll have to forgive her for being so sensitive. I'm sure it will all work out. The tears come hot and fast, and as soon as I'm outside, the world begins to melt, colors and shapes bleeding together. The day is perfectly still. The sun has just cinched past the middle of the sky, a flat white disk, like a circle of heated metal. A red balloon is caught in a tree. It must have been there for a while. It is going limp, bobbling, bobbing listlessly, half deflated at the end of a string. I don't know if I'll face Brian when I, I don't know how I'll face Brian when I go back inside. I don't know how I'll face him ever. A thousand awful things race through my mind, insults I'd like to hurl at him. At least I don't look like a tapeworm. Or, has it ever occurred to you that you're allergic to life? But I know I won't. I can't say any of those things. Besides, the problem isn't really that he wheezes or is allergic to everything. The problem is that he doesn't think I'm, the problem isn't even that he doesn't think I'm pretty. The problem is, he isn't Alex. Behind me, the door squeaks open. Brian says, Lena, I mash my palms against my cheeks quickly, wiping away the tears. The absolute last thing in the world I want is for Brian to know that his stupid comment has upset me. I'm fine, I call back without turning since I'm sure I look like a mess. I'll come inside in a second. He must be stupid or stubborn because he doesn't leave me alone. Instead, he closes the door behind him and comes down off the front stoop. I hear him wheezing a few feet behind me. Your mom said it was okay if I came out with you, he says. She's not my mom, I correct him quickly. I don't know why it seems so important to say. I used to like it when people confused Carol for my mom. It meant they didn't know the real story. Then again, I used to like a lot of things, things that seem ridiculous now. Oh, right. Brian must know something about my real mom. It's on the record he would have seen. Sorry, I forgot. Of course you did, I think, but don't say anything. At least the fact that he's hovering over me has made me too angry to be sad anymore. The tears have stopped. I cross my arms and wait for him to take the hint or get tired of staring at my back and go inside. But the steady wheezing continues. I've known him less than a half an hour and I already could kill him. Finally, I get tired of standing in silence, so I turn around and brush past him quickly. Feeling much better now, I say. I don't look at him as I start towards the house. We should go in. Wait, Lena? He reaches out and grabs my wrist. I guess grabs really isn't the right word. More like wipes sweat on. But I stop anyway, though I still can't bring myself to meet his eyes. Instead, I keep my eyes locked on the front door, noticing for the first time that the screen has three large holes in it near the upper right corner. No wonder the house has been full of insects this summer. Grace found a ladybug in our bedroom the other day. She brought it to me cupped in her tiny palm. I helped her carry it downstairs and release it outside. I feel an overwhelming rush of sadness, unrelated to Alex or Brian or any of that. I'm just struck with a sense of time passing so quickly, rushing forward. One day I'll wake up and my whole life will be behind me, and it will seem to have gone as quickly as a dream. I didn't mean for you to hear what I said before, he says. I wonder if his mom has made him say this. The words seem to require a tremendous effort on his part. It was rude. As if I haven't already been completely humiliated, now he has to apologize for calling me ugly. My cheeks feel like they're going to melt off, they're so hot. Don't worry about it, I say, trying to extricate my wrist from his hand. Surprisingly, he won't let me go, even though technically he shouldn't be touching me at all. What I meant was, his mouth works up and down for a second, he won't meet my eyes. He keeps scanning the street behind me, his eyes darting back and forth like a cat watching a bird. What I meant was, you looked happier in the pictures. This is a surprise, and for a second I can't think of a response. I don't seem happy now, I sputter out, and then feel even more embarrassed. It's so weird to be having this conversation with a stranger, knowing he won't be a stranger for very much longer. But he doesn't seem freaked out by the question. He just shakes his head. I know you aren't, he says. He drops my wrist, but I don't feel as desperate to go inside anymore. He's still staring off at the street behind me, and I sneak a closer look at his face. I guess he could be kind of good-looking. Not nearly so gorgeous as Alex, obviously. He's super pale and slightly feminine-looking, with a full, round mouth and a small, tapered nose. But his eyes are a clear, pale blue, like a morning sky, and he has a nice, strong jawline. And now I start to feel guilty. 
He must know I'm unhappy because I've been paired with him. It's not his fault I've changed. Seen the light or contra contracted the deliria, depending on who you ask? Maybe both. I'm sorry, I say. It's not you. I'm just, I'm just scared about the procedure, that's all. I think of how many nights I used to fantasize about stretching out on the operating table, waiting for the anesthesia to turn the world to fog, waiting to wake up renewed. Now I'll be waking up to a world without Alex. I'll be waking up into the fog, everything gray and blurry and unrecognizable. Brian is looking at me finally with an expression I can't identify at first. Then I realize. Pity. He feels sorry for me. He starts speaking all in a rush. Listen, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but before my procedure, I was like you. His eyes click back to the street. The wheezing has stopped. He speaks clearly but low so Carol and his mom can't hear through the open window. I didn't... I wasn't ready. He licks his lips, drops his voice to a whisper. There was a girl I used to see sometimes at the park. She babysat for her cousins, used to bring them to the playground there. I was captain on the fencing team in high school. That's where we practiced. You would be captain of the frigging fencing team, I think. But I don't say this out loud. I can tell he's trying to be nice. Anyway, we used to talk sometimes. Nothing happened, he qualifies quickly. Just a few conversations here and there. She had a pretty smile, and I felt... He trails off. Wonder and fear sweep through me. He's trying to tell me that we're alike. He somehow knows about Alex. Not about Alex specifically, but about someone. Wait a second. My mind is turning. Are you trying to tell me that before the procedure you got sick? I'm just saying I understand. His eyes flick to mine for barely a fraction of a second, but that's all I need. I'm positive now. He knows I've been infected. I'm both relieved and terrified. If he can see it, other people will see it too. My point is only that the cure works. He places extra emphasis on the last word. I know now that he's trying to be kind. I'm much happier now. You will be too, I promise. Something inside of me fractures when he says that, and I feel like I could cry again. His voice is so reassuring. There's nothing I want more in that moment than to believe him. Safety, happiness, stability. That's what I've wanted my whole life. And for that moment, I think maybe the past few weeks really have been some long, strange delirium. Maybe after the procedure, I'll wake up from a high fever with only a vague recollection of my dreams and a sense of overwhelming relief. Friends, Brian says, offering me his hand to shake, and this time I don't flinch when he touches me. I even let him hold my hand an extra few seconds. He's still facing the street, and as we're standing there, a frown flickers temporarily across his face. What does he want, he mutters, and then calls out, It's okay, she's my pair. I turn around just in time to see a flash of burnt golden brown hair, the color of leaves in autumn, disappear around the corner. Alex. I wrench my hand away from Brian's, but it's too late. He's gone. Must have been a regulator, Brian says. He was just standing there, staring. The feeling of calm and reassurance I'd had only a minute earlier vanishes in a rush. Alex saw me. He saw us, holding hands, heard Brian say I was his pair, and I was supposed to have met him an hour ago. He doesn't know that I couldn't get out of the house, couldn't get a message to him. I can't imagine what he must be thinking about me right now. Or actually, I can't imagine. Are you okay? Brian's eyes are so pale they're almost gray. A sickly color, not like the sky at all, like mold or rot. I can't believe I thought he could be attractive for even one second. You don't look too good. I'm fine. I try to take a step toward the house and stumble. Brian reaches out to steady me, but I twist away from him. I'm fine, I repeat, even though everything around me is breaking, fracturing. It's hot out here, he says. I can't stand to look at him. Let's go inside. He puts a hand on my elbow and propels me up the stairs through the door and into the living room where Carol and Mrs. Scharf are waiting for us, smiling.